Hi everyone, I'm Amna Nawaz from the PBS NewsHour, and I'm very excited to be here in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. Mr. Secretary, hi, nice to see you again. Amna, good to be with you. So I want to ask you, first of all, about vaccination rates. There's a lot to talk about in terms of what you're responsible for in your agency, but we have seen now in recent numbers, despite tens of thousands of new COVID cases every day, vaccination rates have been slowing somewhat. So I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about why you think we're seeing that now and also how worried you are if those rates continue to slow, what it means for your timeline for herd immunity. So it's, um, it's hard to be disappointed that more than 2 million people a day are getting vaccinated. It's, it's kind of sad news because we reach at one point 4 million a day. But the good news is that more than 2 million people are still coming forward to get vaccinated. And Amna, that's what we need to do. That's why almost 100 million people so far have been fully vaccinated. Two thirds of seniors, by the way, are already vaccinated completely. And we just gotta keep going. The, the fact that President Biden could ex expand on his uh, goal of 100 million shots in arms in his first 100 days and was able to double that, that's all good news. We just can't stop. We have to keep on that stride, keep Americans safe, keep them getting vaccinated. Well, what about some of the folks who are maybe a little bit hesitant now, especially after the, the pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? We've heard reports of people skipping their second doses in some cases because they're worried or they think, I'm fine, I'm, I'm good enough. What would you say to those folks? Well, please do everything that keeps you safe, because if you keep yourself safe, you'll keep your family safe. And so what we're trying to do is go to where you are. We don't want to wait till you come to us to find a place to get vaccinated. We're going to go to where you are. And so today there are more than 75,000 sites around the country where you can get vaccinated. Nine in 10 Americans are within five miles of a vaccination site. We're going to help the community clinics that serve so many of our uh, families get the information out there to people and have the vaccines ready to go. We're going to trusted people, the people in your community that you count on to help you know how to navigate this so you'll get vaccinated. We're doing everything we can, but most importantly, we're going to go to you. We're not going to wait till you come to us. Can I follow up on that a little bit, though, because we've seen and I know there's limited race and ethnicity data on vaccinations so far, but the data that you do have, which is about a little over half of all the vac vaccinations, I think, shows they've overwhelmingly gone to white Americans. And we know those aren't the communities that have been hardest hit in the pandemic. So talk to us a little bit more about how you're making sure, because even five miles sometimes is too far for some people if you don't have a car to get to a vaccination site. How are you getting to the folks hardest hit in the pandemic? Amna, you just pointed out what, what's become glaring as a result of COVID, that we have a health system that has many inequities. And we're trying to deal with those disparities as best we can. That's why we're not going to wait till you come to us. That's why this week we announced an investment of a billion dollars in community clinics, because 70 percent of the people that have been vaccinated at community clinics are people of color. And that's why we're going to these community core members who are trusted individuals in communities to help identify the people that need to get shots and convince them that it's a good thing to do. But we're, we're getting there. And uh, you're right. We're, we're at a good stride. We were going faster when it came to vaccines a little earlier, but we're still at a good stride. And we want to reach everyone, regardless of the corner of the country you're in, we're going to find you. Let me ask you a little bit about messaging on this front, because there are folks who may not have great access or folks who may have been kind of waiting to see how it rolled out. And then are, there are folks who are just straight up reluctant. They do not want to get the vaccine. And we've had recent polling, our own PBS NewsHour polls among them that have shown a full 40 percent of people who identify as Republican in this country say they do not plan to get vaccinated. So in a time when masks, social distancing, science, this has all become politicized in the middle of a pandemic. I think it's fair to say that maybe you and other Democratic administration officials aren't necessarily the most effective messengers when it comes to reaching that segment of the population. So what's your plan? How do you plan to get the message to them? Well, we're going to do everything we can, and we're going to use everyone who's out there who's a trusted messenger in various communities to do that as well. It could be the person of faith in one community. It could be the civic leader in another. It could be the high school wrestling coach in another community. Whoever it is, we're going to try to enlist those folks to become the messengers because we, we want to make sure that people understand it's not just the folks in Washington who believe it's a good idea for you to get vaccinated. It's not just the scientists. It's your loved ones. 
It's your neighbors. It's the people you count on day to day, day in, day out, to make sure that what you do and your family does not only are safe things to do, but it's the right thing to do. Would it help you if other prominent Republican leaders came out and said publicly, I support the vaccine, you should get vaccinated? Have you Absolutely. asked any to do that? Absolutely. We, as I said, we're reaching out to everyone, and we've got a, a lot of leaders, regardless of political stripe, red or blue, who've been out there trying to help us, and that really counts for a lot. And so the more the, that message is repeated by others, especially those you trust, the greater the chance that you're going to get vaccinated. But the most important thing, Amna, that we can do is show people the results. Quick, quick sense. It used to be that most of the deaths we were hearing about from COVID were of our grandparents, our older populations. Today, two thirds of all seniors are vaccinated. If you take a look at the numbers when it comes to the people who are getting sick and dying, it's no longer our seniors. And so the impact of the vaccine is absolutely out there, proof positive that if you get vaccinated, you can not only stay safe, you can live. Um, on the issue of health care and the Affordable Care Act, uh, we saw last month President Biden expanded and extended the special enrollment period, right? I think that runs through mid-August now. Thousands of people in the previous enrollment extension have already signed up. Uh, I guess when you look at what the goal is for in terms of number of enrollees or how you think that enrollment will help close some of those disparities in our health care system that were made so evident in the pandemic, what would you say that goal is? The most important role we have is to let you know that you can actually afford to get covered. Uh, too many people have never believed that they could afford to get quality health insurance. Well, President Biden, as a result of the American Rescue Plan, made the Affordable Care Act and its coverage for folks not only available, but far more affordable. There are plans out there now that people qualify for where they're paying around $10 a month for good quality health care. And in some cases, for some Americans who make money, but not very much, could be $0 out of pocket. You can't beat that, especially in this time when you need to have health security. You want the peace of mind to know that if you get sick or your, someone in your family does, you'll have access to the doctor, the hospital that you need. But the best, the best proof of this, go talk to Elsie Hamer and her dad, uh, Dan. Elsie has cystic fibrosis. Uh, Dan was able to get health insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act. He hadn't had it before. Today, Elsie's care is covered. And all the treatments, all the medicines that she has to uh, take and undergo all the time, every day, covered. And Dan will tell you, Nothing better than having Elsie around all the time. And so uh, that was just one experience out there in Carson, Carson City, Nevada. But I can tell you the stories of Dan and Elsie are, are very similar to around, the, around the country where people who've gotten covered know that they have the peace of mind. At the same time, I have to ask you, in this current climate, when everything is so politicized, especially something like the ACA, right? It's been derided by conservatives and Republicans. They've tried multiple times to dismantle it. You have folks who look at it and see it as a democratic effort that they don't want to be a part of. How do you, as the face of this agency, as the head of this agency, message to them the impact that you think it could have? You know, COVID doesn't discriminate based on your politics, red or blue. Uh, at the same time, cystic fibrosis hit Elsie, and I guarantee you she hasn't decided what party she's going to be with. Uh, we have to recognize that we're doing this for our loved ones. And if you don't, well, fine, take the chances. But why take the chances with your loved ones? Uh, we, we think that most Americans, when it's put before them and they see it, you know, plainly, they'll do the right thing. And so for me, Colors don't matter uh, what stripe you are. It's, it's making sure that you know that your loved ones will be protected. And we're going to do everything we can to put it in front of you that your family could be protected. More broadly speaking, uh, the Biden administration has said it's going to put addressing our longstanding inequities at the center of all of its policymaking. And certainly health care is a huge part of that, but it doesn't exist in a silo. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how outside of just expanding insurance access, what kinds of policies, what kinds of plans do you want to put into place that you think could help address some of those gaps that we saw during the pandemic that got even bigger during the pandemic, specifically those racial gaps that we know have existed in healthcare? How do we finally start to close those coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, now you're going to the bullseye, which for me is critical because 
Many American families can afford their health care. I'm fortunate that my wife and I can afford it now as well for our, our families. Uh, but too many couldn't and when I was growing up, and too many can't today. And so you've struck on something very important, uh, getting rid of those disparities. So President Biden made it very clear. Equity has to be at the center of everything we do. And I take that very, uh, not only very seriously, but very personally here at HHS. And so a couple of things that we're doing, very simple things. We just announced an investment of a billion dollars in community clinics. Community clinics, 70% of the people they vaccinated, people of color. Community clinics offer care to people who work and earn a living, but not enough to pay for their health care easily. That's important. Another place we're making a difference, new moms. In America, it's hard to believe, but we have some of the highest rates of mortality of new moms after they give birth. It's crazy in a, in a place like America. So we've made a major investment in maternal mortality and maternal morbidity, and we're trying to do everything we can so that if you're going to be a new mom, you're going to have a chance to watch your child grow up. And that one's as simple as doing something with Medicaid, where what we're saying is rather than offer you the 60 days of care that you can often get under Medicaid if you qualify as a low-income individual, a new mom, for care uh, postpartum after you've delivered, we're going to extend that now for states that want to take us up on this offer up to a year. That's critical for a lot of these new mothers who need that care and can't go off that cliff when it comes to the care they need after they've had that baby. Finally, Mr. Secretary, I want to ask you about another issue um, among many you're responsible for at the agency, and that is the care and custody of migrant children after they cross the U.S. border. That falls under the agency ORR, under HHS, of course. Those numbers continue to grow, right? Hundreds of unaccompanied children are crossing the border every day. I think the administration is spending tens of millions of dollars every week to house them in the existing shelter system, which I know is below capacity in the pandemic, and then stand up emergency shelters and beds to safely house them. In your view, how sustainable is that system? How much longer can you do that? Oh, the, the broken immigration system is showing its cracks, and, and it's showing its cracks when it comes to children. It's, it's unfortunate. It's, uh, it's tragic. But we have a job at HHS. We have to protect those kids. They may not get to stay in the country because that immigration process has to work its way and they may ultimately sent, be sent back to their home country. But while they are in our care, we're going to be responsible. We're going to do it the right way, the legal way. We're going to provide the care that you would provide to any child, basic, the basic necessities. And it's tough. It is a challenge. But a broken immigration system has led us to this point where you have these kids who are unaccompanied in our hands. And while we try to find a sponsor who can uh, shelter them while they are here, uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that they are fine. And we're going to do everything we can to do it the right way. Just to follow up on that, of course, at the same time, those numbers do grow. I think it's nearly 22,000 children currently in HHS care. And while I've been in contact with uh, HHS officials and DHS officials, I know there's been many steps put into place to try to speed up the process through which children are uh, then connected with a sponsor family or existing family member here. The experts tell you again and again, right, that these kinds of federal facilities, regardless of how well they're set up, are not the best place for children. And the more children you have, the more chances are something falls through the cracks. How worried are you about something like that happening? We're always concerned that we want to make sure we're doing the best for a child. But let me put it to you this way. Having that child temporarily in our care, where we have people who do observation, provide services for, that are appropriate for a child, versus having that child alone in the desert, uh, or even that child uh, in the hands of the Customs and Border Patrol, uh, where they are not, uh, they don't have the facilities to deal with children. They're usually dealing with adults. Uh, where would I rather see that child? I'd love to see that child in, in loving hands, first and foremost. But short of that, if we're going to be the custodians of these children for a while, then we're going to do it the best way we can, be it responsible, and, and make sure that their care is provided. Uh, but I agree with you. I mean, uh, I would want to make sure my kids have everything. In fact, I did everything I could to make sure my kids had what they needed. And we'll do what we can to provide the essentials for these children. But is, is it what we expect moving forward? Well, we want to make sure that they are in loving hands. But until then, we'll do what we can. And it is a challenge. It is expensive. But I think we understand we've got obligations, both legally and morally, to do right by any child. 
Last question on the pandemic, if you don't mind, because I'd love to get your take. This is the question on all Americans' minds. Given where vaccination rates are, given what we know about the new variants, given all the factors that go into addressing this pandemic, what is your timeline for when you think Americans can feel as if they are through the worst of the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic in some way? Well, I'm like, you laid the heaviest question on me <laughs> at the end there. Uh, let me put it to you this way. This week, uh, President Biden is announcing that if you have been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, you can actually do almost everything outside without having to worry about wearing a mask. Unless you are in a large gathering of people, uh, you know, uh, athletic events with large crowds and so forth, you can probably go outside without your mask. If you're not vaccinated, you really should be wearing a mask. And so what I can tell you is this, if Americans get vaccinated, to, so we get to every last one of them, we're gonna get to back to normal a lot faster. How long will it take? Amna, you tell me how long it's gonna take to get all those Americans who haven't yet been vaccinated to go in and get their shot. Then I'll let you know the answer to the question you asked me. I can tell you with assurance, I have no idea, but I know we're all <laughs> looking forward to that day. Uh, Secretary Javier Becerra of Health and Human Services, thank you so much for your time. It's always good to talk to you. Great to be with you.